Hello, and welcome to a program. This one's called Sailors, Soldiers, and Spies. This is going to be a discussion and review of 10 novels in this um, genre, considered uh, techno thrillers and military fiction. And we're going to give you some reviews and uh, opinions about these titles and hope um, that you'll find them interesting. So we invite interested readers to explore the following titles of a genre that once held a great deal of popularity. This was the Cold War, when espionage and techno thrillers and classic military historic fiction were common. In the 1980s and later, these were among the most popular books um, on the shelf. There were authors like Tom Clancy and W.E.B. Griffin. Many of them had bestsellers. The general idea was that the West um, versus the USSR and other well-defined enemies fought battles on pages that could have actually happened in real life. Fortunately, most of these scenarios never did occur. But in a world now that's still fulfilled with tensions and concerns, um, we offer this discussion and hope that it would be an interesting diversion for you from your daily life. So. Let's see who the good guys were and be reminded of why we love our heroes. And now I'm going to start uh, with the first novel. That would be by Tom Clancy. The novel is Patriot Games. came out in 1987 originally. It is a techno thriller starring and um, giving the background to the main character in Clancy's books, Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan is a consultant for the CIA, but not yet a member of the organization. He is visiting the UK and by accident stops a terrorist attack, which was an assassination attempt on the Prince and Princess of Wales by the IRA. The IRA was a terrorist organization that was attempting by force and any other means to reunite Ireland under complete Irish control, removing the British completely. This was a very serious and daily concern in that part of the world uh, at that time and is, at least was a uh, very important um, aspect of international news. So it was a, a topic that most people would have been familiar with at the time. Ryan is wounded, but uh, survives. He kills uh, one or two of the terrorists, but one survives, a man named Sean Miller. Ryan becomes popular with the royals and friends with them. And um, meanwhile, Sean Miller is supposed to go to jail, but is actually broken out by other members of his organization where they flee to Africa to train. Ryan returns home to the U.S., lives in Maryland, uh, worked at the U.S. Naval Academy, but he has connections with the CIA as a consultant, and he works with a man named Admiral James Greer. They decide that it would be interesting and maybe useful to see if they could follow up on the IRA or other terrorist organizations for both personal and professional means. Ryan is uh, somewhat reluctant to become full member of the CIA, but Sean Miller and others come to the U.S. and actually uh, do another assassination attempt on him and his family. His wife and daughter are severely injured, but they do survive. And Ryan decides to become fully involved in attempting to stop the terrorists. Sean Miller and the others come back again um, when later that year, Ryan has invited the Prince and Princess of Wales to his house, uh, thinking that everything is safe. But in fact, they're not. They are attacked at the home, escaped to the Naval Academy, where there's uh, a firefight in Annapolis and then in Baltimore. Uh, terrorists are captured. Ryan has a chance to kill the terrorists, but does not. And when he realizes that he is a man of principle and law, 
And that becomes the theme that if everyone, including the Irish, the Northern Irish, and the UK, anyone in the UK, if they all worked for the principles of law, and if they were effectively governed everyone, then the terrorist uh, manifesto would no longer be of any use and that there would be a much more peaceful situation. Ultimately, that does occur through uh, discussions, meetings, and the IRA is no longer what it was, was depending on uh, your definition of uh, Northern Ireland and, and the troubles as they once were. This was a very popular book during that summer and later. Ryan is a character throughout many of Clancy's books. Uh, Clancy was one of the hottest uh, authors in the late 80s and in the 90s. And they had other uh, books and series splintered off by ghostwriters and others. So, if you have an interest in this sort of uh, action thriller, and it's set in this local area, there's many discussions of Merlin and uh, locales, then I would highly recommend this book. And if you're interested in the history of uh, UK or Ireland, Irish, US relations, or just a vague interest that you might be an Irish American. This is one of the books that I'd recommend. And with that, I am going to send you over to Martin Seaboth, and he's going to discuss a different novel from a different time. Um, Killer Angels by Michael Shara. Quote, simply the best Civil War novel ever written. The descriptions of combat are incomparable. They convey not just the sights, but the noise and the smell of battle. And the, and the characterizations are simply superb. Shara has managed to capture the essence of war, the divided friendships, the madness, and the heroism. Stephen Oates. Quote, remarkable a book that simply changed my life. I had never visited Gettysburg before, knew almost nothing about that battle before I read this book, but here it all came alive. Ken Burns. The Killer Angels received the 1975 Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It has been required reading at the U.S. Ar Army Officer Candidate School, the Citadel, the U.S. Army Command, and the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. The book was turned into a movie in 1993 entitled Gettysburg and starred Tom Berenger, Jeff Daniels, Stephen Lang, Martin Sheen, and one of my favorite actors, <clears throat> Sam Elliott. Killer Angels at its heart tells the story of the Battle of Gettysburg. It presents both a factual retelling of events as well as the emotional experience of living it. Shara selects four people as the main viewpoint characters and moves back and forth between them as the story progresses. This approach builds tension and allows personal connections to be made with the characters. Their backgrounds, their desires, their beliefs and fears are all revealed in this novel. On the Confederate side, he focuses on Robert E. Lee and Longstreet, while on the Union side, he focuses on Buford and Chamberlain. He adds a couple of additional viewpoints using the characters of Harrison, who is a Confederate spy, Armistead, who's one of the Confederate commanders under Pickett, and Fremantle, an English observer on the Confederate side. These viewpoints give the reader a view of the action from the different levels of command and from the sidelines and from right in the middle of the action. Another other of the main strengths, another of the many strengths of this book is Shara's expert use of maps. The maps depict the positioning of the troops as they went into battle, as they advanced, and as they retreated. It kind of lets you play like general and see whether you agree with the decisions made, what you might have done different, etc. In summary, if you buy one historical fiction novel on the Civil War, let it be this one. Highest re recommended. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jimmy, who's going to do a talk about Webb Griffin. Death at Nuremberg. Webb Griffin and his son, William E. Butterworth IV, have a very good book here about the end of World War II 
and what happened in Germany right after this with the ex-Nazis in the Odessa organization. Webb Griffin was a soldier in the U.S. Army after World War II in Germany with the constabu U.S. Constabulary under General I.D. White. James Cronley, the main character, was head of the OSS DCI in Germany. He is a 22-year-old captain, which is very unusual for this. Not only does he have to protect the head U.S. prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials from kidnapping by the K NKGB, now the KGB or whatever they're calling themselves this week, he also has to protect his family, his friends from assassination, and he has some love interest. He is in love with a, his high school sweetheart and his administrative assistant and, and a dashing war correspondent for the Associated Press. This book is very good. It has been given numerous um, um, accolades by the Wall Street Journal, Publishers Weekly, and other list things. It has been translated into Hebrew, Chinese, Japanese, Hungarian, and other languages. And over 50 million books are in print. Cronley does keep the U.S. prosecutor safe, captures the, quote, head of the Odessa organization, a gentleman named Franz von Diedelberg, and sees that he is put in jail at Nuremberg, tried, convicted, and hung for his crimes. If anyone wants to read a good book about the end of World War II and what we were doing, trying to make the world safe, not only from the Russians, but the ex-Nazis, I would recommend Death at Nuremberg. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Jim Kirshner. And our next novel uh, takes us back to the Cold War in the 1970s, 1980s period. This one is called Firefox. Uh, again, a techno thriller. The author is Craig Thomas, uh, who was possibly considered as a uh, forerunner of this genre uh, for the UK, uh, similar to Tom Clancy in the US. A little background to this, um, in 1976, a Soviet MiG-25 uh, defected to Japan, flown by Lieutenant Viktor Belenko. The Foxbat had been considered um, a mysterious and potentially very dangerous aircraft. Very little was known about it. It was highly secretive in a world uh, from a country that is absolutely highly secretive. It certainly was at that time. Um, Thomas took the general idea that um, the Soviets had developed a plane that was so far in advance of the Western world that the CIA and MI6 in the UK came up with no other plan but to steal one, literally force it um, uh, out of the uh, USSR. So they take a Vietnam pilot who was dealing with PSTD, or sorry, PD, PTSD, I'm sorry. Is that right? PTSD. Um, and train him uh, to fly this aircraft because he has a background, uh, well, knowledge of speaking Russian and so forth. They, um, through various means, um, espionage, uh, cover, um, murder, they get him to the uh, Soviet air base to fly the plane. And he does, with great difficulty, manage to escape. There is a battle with the, there are only two of this type of aircraft at the time called the MiG-31. Uh, that's been overtaken by reality that there really is a MiG-31 in the Russian Air Force. It has nothing to do with this book or this airplane. And he does escape, um, has a battle with the second aircraft. And um, at the end of the novel, uh, he is on his way home. There's, in fact, a sequel to this called Firefox Down, which goes into more detail. But this discusses, excuse me, this discusses um, the Cold War um, situation at the time, which was uh, fairly tense. Uh, the book, again, was written in the late 70s. There was a great deal of 
responsibility of World War III occurring for various reasons throughout uh, what Eastern Europe or the Middle East uh, and even in uh, India and China. So this takes uh, that tension and tries to find a way to insert this damaged human uh, whose name is Mitchell Grant, Mitchell Gant, uh, to fly the airplane and save the West from its own limitations. And concluding uh, the discussion of Firefox, if you're interested in the Cold War, uh, US-UK relations versus the USSR um, aircraft or technology or any of the um, uh, hardware type of novels, then this is probably one you would enjoy. Many may remember, uh, depending on your age, uh, a 1982 movie uh, starring Clint Eastwood as Mitchell Gann uh, in the movie of the same name, Firefox. Uh, it was an um, uh, interesting action film for this time. Did not go into full detail of the espionage and the humanity that the book does, but you might be interested in looking it up sometime or watching uh, clip from YouTube uh, that does have some fun action scenes. With that, um, we're going to move from this 1977 novel, uh, and we're going to uh, go over now back to Jerry Clowes and discuss another Tom Clancy novel, uh, which was his very first one. Hello, everyone. Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy was his first novel. He wrote this while he was an insurance agent in Southern Maryland, and he didn't like it, so he shelved it for a few years. Well, when it came back and burst onto the scene, it was Jack Ryan's first book. The main character, Jack Ryan, was working for the CIA at that point, living over in London. He gets called back for consultation, and at that point, the US, he brought with him a camera with some pictures on it of the newest Soviet submarine, the Red October. There's just one little problem with this sub. It had a new silent drive system called a Caterpillar that the Russians had developed in secrecy and the West had nothing to counter it. But a captain, one gentleman named Captain Marco Ramius, was upset with the Soviet system. His wife had died of cancer and a surgeon who was drunk on duty. And when they took her to the hospital, he spent too long sniffing pure oxygen to um, regain his faculties. And this is Remius's appendix person. Well, Marco decided to take his revenge out on the Soviet system. He got placed in command of the newest Soviet submarine, the Red October. He picked his crew and they decided, yes, they were going to defect with a nice little present for the West, a Soviet sub. Well, not to go into too much detail, Remios and the crew go out of port, they kill the political officer, and Marco proceeds on his way. I guess he had a feeling for the Soviet system because he posted a letter to a friend of his, the head political admiral, saying, hey, uncle, I'm going to defect with the Red October. Well, this starts one of the biggest naval operations the world has seen since World War II. The Brits are involved, Jack Ryan's involved, Ryan goes out to a British carrier and is flown to a U.S. sub and they make contact with Ramius. Ryan and some of the U.S. crew members go on to the Soviet sub, they get most of the Soviet sub crew off, they blow up an old U.S. sub to make the Soviets think that uh, the Red October has sunk, and then they sneak into the Outer Banks area of North Carolina, sit until the Soviet, sit submerged until the Soviet um, subs and 
surface ships leave and then try and sneak up into Norfolk. There's just one problem. One of his old students and his sub stayed behind. And they have a little battle off the coast of Norfolk. So the Soviet sub is destroyed. Ryan has been the helmsman of the Soviet sub. They get the sub into Norfolk. The U.S. gets one of the biggest prizes Western intelligence has gotten in the last 50 years. And Ryan gets to go home to his family for Christmas. Clancy, even though this was his first book, has written many, many others under his own name. And then after he died, you still see Clancy books being published. He, his estate, gave the rights to several authors to ghostwrite with Clancy and use Clancy's name. Tom Clancy was an author and gentleman from Southern Maryland. He was an insurance agent. He had a house called Peregrine Cliff, which is the setting for some of the other Jack Ryan escapades where in the books. Um, Ryan becomes a national figure and eventually president in some of Clancy's books. I won't go any further because I don't want to spoil it. So if you want to read a book with some local flair, local um, places, very good author, Tom Clancy, Hunt for Red October, even though it was written in the 80s, you still can find copies in bookstores and online today. That's it, and now I'm going to send it back, I believe, to Martin. Such a classic, such a classic, Jimmy. Uh, the book I'm going to cover is called Guns of the South, and it's by Harry Turtledove. This is a historical fiction novel that literally throws everything in the kitchen sink in, and then some. For some readers, this concept will hit them as creative, innovative, and even wild, while others will see it as a stretch or even ridiculous. So what are we talking about? Just as the Confederate's cause seems lost, deliverance arise in the form of 20th, 20th century weapons. So where do these weapons come from? Well, of course, they come from South African white supremacists with access to a time travel machine. who conclude that their philosophy would find support in a, victor, in a victorious confederacy, and they begin large shipments of AK-47 rifles from 21st century Johannesburg to 19th century Virginia. I mean, this all makes sense, doesn't it? Their hope is to provide a haven for slavery and extreme racism that will last into succeeding centuries. The South, dazzled and thrilled by the possibilities of this new weapon, Robert E. Lee and his troops grab the guns and turn the war and American history around. Harry Turtledove is a renowned and prolific writer. He has written separately in and combined historical fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and alternate history genres. Publishers Weekly has done Turtledove the master of alternate history. Within the genre, he is known for creating original alternate history, scenarios involving the survival of the Byzantine Empire, or even an alien invasion during World War II. In addition, he has been given credit for giving original treatment to alternate themes that have been presented by others, including including the victory of the South in the Civil War, which Turtle Dove has given lots of credit to author McKinley Cantor for his novel, If the South Had Won the Civil War, and the victory of Nazi Germany during World War II. Turtle Dove has been a huge influence in the alternate history field and has provided readers with a large number of books to explore his creative mind and his well-researched material. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jim, who's going to take us on another cruise in military history. Thank you, Lord. 
Our next novel is written by Ralph Peters. Ralph Peters uh, was in the U.S. Army, um, in a um, tank um, commander, I believe, among other things, intelligence officer. He uh, writes, or in this case, in 1991, wrote a novel called The War in 2020. He takes his um, characters usually through fairly harsh um, conditions and uh, situations. And uh, it does take a little get getting used to, but it, it offers uh, a lot of uh, fascinating possibilities. Again, this was written in 1991 about a war in 2020, which of course is happening right now. Um, it is a fairly dystopian novel where over the last um, 15, 20 years in the history of the United States, things have not gone well after Desert Storm and so forth. There's been social unrest, economic disaster, um, wars elsewhere in the world. With the United States, uh, unfortunately, uh, participated. The situation is the Soviet Union, as such as it is, is barely able to hold off Islamic unions and member member states who are becoming radicalized, uh, along with Iran and so forth, to try to destroy the Soviet Union and the West and the rest. Of the Japan um, has become more militarized and wants to be a superpower. In today's reality, it's China, but in this novel, it's Japan becomes pretty much the way they were during the imperial times during World War II. The situation, um, mainly guided by the main character named George Taylor, is a cavalry officer in the U.S. Army, the air cavalry. And the background is, at some point uh, before 2020, there was a war in Zaire in Africa, and the U.S. actually sent troops to the South African region. There is a lot of disaster and death, and ultimately, uh, the U.S. decides to use nuclear weapons on South Africa. This results in um, total world opinion against the U.S. in the banning of nuclear weapons. Not only that, but many of the U.S. troops were killed, captured, and it is the worst disaster in U.S. military history. And because of the situation with the fallout and other unfortunate uh, Consequences of the war and the location, a plague breaks out. It's a severe, deadly plague that leaves the survivors badly scarred, particularly in the face and so forth. So the few survivors are known, you know, to have been uh, a member of this expedition and its its uh, unfortunate uh, result. George Taylor is one of those men, and women, there are women as well, sort of, but he is one of these soldiers that uh, uh, has the scars, and because of his uh, bitterness towards what happened, he does not uh, try to get the scars removed with plastic surgery, as other people do, and he doesn't want to forget what happened. So in 2020, um, the Muslims, uh, the Islamic uh, revolution is in such a state that the Russians have actually asked for help. And the United States, which in its own fashion has survived the last few years, under its first African-American president, sends an expedition uh, with George Taylor as a member to the uh, Soviet Union area, uh, Ukraine and so forth, to try to stop them. They actually are successful. However, the Japanese had developed a weapon which is some consider even worse than the nuclear weapons which no longer exist in the world. It is a 
weapon that destroys the brain, but not the body. You know, some kind of hyper sound or something that uh, is sent out through speakers on aircraft and so forth. They use this weapon uh, against uh, many of the people, and the few that survive, um, there's absolutely no hope for them to recover mentally. They, they exist, but they are no longer the people that once were. George Taylor, um, fortunately, gets through and ultimately destroys the satellite and radio connections to these weapons, and the Japanese are then helpless. The war ends, and the U.S. and the Soviets, after a fashion, are successful. It's a very, uh, again, as I said, harsh novel. Um, weapons are uh, rather notorious, and there's not really a happy ending other than the fact that or perhaps most people have survived and are no longer interested in war, that they just can't deal with it anymore, even the Japanese. Uh, it is a little harsh. It does it is, it is aging bashing a bit. Uh, and different situations are brought to their extreme so that these can exist in this novel situation. In the final act, there is a young man who had met a Russian woman. He's full of hope, and she's just accepting in Russian fashion that your life may go on and may not. Oh, for the best, expect the worst. Uh, but then ultimately, the very last line is he does go back to her, um, thinking that, uh, hey, we can make it after all and ask her to marry him. So then there's one individual uh, who between a man and a woman about uh, maybe uh, maybe there's a future after all. So this is, uh, again, it was written in 1991, about 2020. 2020 is, uh, uh, has, nothing like, has nothing like what's uh, the novel, other than the fact that we're dealing with a worldwide plague. Um, there's a lot of tension uh, right now with China. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just trying to get through it day to day. I don't have any kind of background as a soldier, as uh, well, Peters does, and his characters are uh, always uh, members of the military. But uh, keeping the faith, as it were, is one of the themes, and that uh, there is hope after all. It's uh, the ultimate uh, arc of the story. So, if you're interested in something that uh, might scare you a little bit, but um, make it through with some of the characters, then I would recommend this book and other books by Ralph Peters. Many of them are very specifically Cold War thrillers of uh, alternate uh, history, uh, World War III, uh, what would happen up front on the lines of the soldiers' eyes uh, in a war that uh, could go nuclear at any time. And the, uh, that overall theme of uh, ultimate destruction and the people who are trying to stop so with that, uh, we are now going to move over to, uh, I believe, we actually forgive me going back to Jimmy. And he's going to do The Deserter. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Jim. The Deserter by Nelson D. Mill. Captain Kyle Mercer, U.S. Army Delta Force, is over in Afghanistan. He dis disappears from his post. They don't know, did he just walk away? Was he captured and kidnapped by the Taliban, but eventually he ends up with the Taliban. Years later, he is spotted in Caracas, Venezuela. The top military brass of the U.S. sent the CID Criminal Investigation Division Special Agents Scott Brody and Aggie Taylor to Venezuela to capture Mr. Captain Mercer and bring him back to the U.S. to stand in trial for desertion. Desertion is one of the only crimes in the U.S. military that you can be shot for. So the stakes are high. But Venezuela is in chaos. Mob rule. Captain Mercer is in charge of one of these mobs. He has his own private army in the forest of Venezuela. And these guys are doing everything from drug dealing to kidnapping 
rape, robbery, murder. And when the main character, Scott Brody, and the beautiful Maggie Taylor go to Venezuela, they end up getting invited to go to Captain Mercer's compound. They eventually get out, get Captain Mercer, and haul him back to the U.S. Nelson DeMille is a U.S. Army veteran of the Vietnam era. He's also very learned. He has three doctorates. And this book, The Deserter, is current. It was written in 2019, probably based on the story of a U.S. Army soldier who supposedly was kidnapped by the Taliban, stayed with him for a few months, and then got rescued. You want a good read. It has love interest in it between some of the characters. I would recommend The Deserter by Nelson DeMille. And now I'm going to kick it over to Martin with the book, The Black Cross. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, yes, indeed, Greg Isles, The Black Cross. And Greg Isles, who's relatively new to the historical and military fiction genre, is no stranger to those of us who read mystery super thrillers. His 24 hours is to be the best example of a heart racing, can't put the book down thriller that has been printed. In Black Cross, Isles takes those elements and applies them to a Holocaust World War II novel. It's 1944, an American pacifist, Dr. Mark McConnell, is recruited from his Oxford chemistry lab by Brigadier General Duff Smith to undertake a potential suicide mission into Nazi Germany. The Reich possesses nerve gases that the Allies suspect Hitler will use against their D-Day invasion forces. Forbidden from assigning any Brits to the mission, but with Churchill's secret blessing, Brigadier Smith pairs Dr. McConnell with Jonas Stern, who is a militant Zionist of German descent. Their objective, recent release an allied version of Saren, code name Black Cross, on Tottenhausen, the very death camp that serves as the Nazis' place for further gas research and where Jews are the subjects of these experiments. I also does a great job of mixing historical characters with fictional characters to create a fast-moving, well-researched, and believable novel. Uh, one under, other interesting note I want to mention about Greg Isles, uh, when I worked back at the Hillcrest Heights Library in the mid-90s, um, Isles agreed to do a call-in during one of our book discussion groups, and we discussed his novel, The Quiet Game. He stayed on the line for over an hour as a guest speaker, but also participated as just one of 10 participants discussing the strengths and weaknesses of his novel. He was informative, he was good-natured, and was also generous in exhibiting his listening skills. Um, for me, it remains a highlight of my career with the PGC, Prince George's County Memorial Library System, uh, Greg Isles' appearance. And it was at the time, like I said, when his career was just really starting to get off. So, you know, you'll feel like you were at the ground floor of someone who you knew was going to make it big, but before he had made it and just sat there and participated in a call-in session with uh, our book discussion group in Hillcrest. So, Kudos to Greg Isles. And back to Jimmy now, I think, for our final book. Yes, Kremlin Strike by Dale Brown. In Kremlin Strike, Brad McClanahan and the Iron Wolf Squadron must fight the Russians on a dangerous, untested battlefield, that of outer space. The Russians are building up their space defenses. The new Russian president is wanting to control the whole world from space. The new president of the United States John Dalton Farrell intends to challenge this act of aggression head on. He turns to Brad and Patrick McClanahan and the Iron Wolf Squadron to do this. In the squadron, there is a former Polish Special Service Officer named Nadia Rusnik. This officer is serving even though she has two prosthetic legs from actions she had done previous. So, the Iron Wolf Squadron keeps the Russians from taking over the world. Um, Brad and 
the wonderful Nadia become fast friends and a couple. This book, Kremlin Strike by Dale Brown, is one of his better ones. Dale Brown is a former navigator in B-52's bombers of the United States Air Force. He, one of his first books was Flight of the Old Dog, and that's what his bomber was called, the Old Dog. Well, if anyone knows anything about the B-52, the B-52s are over 50 years old and they're still flying, first line defense for the United States. I've been down to Shreveport, Louisiana, and right outside of the city is a base where the B-52 flies. You don't want to be sleeping in a hotel room on the second floor when at about 2.30 in the morning, they call an alert. And the runway just happens to send them off right over your hotel. Believe me, that was not a night for sleep. It's amazing that something that big and that ugly can fly and has been flying for 50 years. The B-52 has a nickname, Buff, Big Ugly Fat Fellow. And yes, it is a big, ugly, fat fellow. Dale Brown has been called one of the best military adventure writers in the world today. And that was by Clive Kosler. So if you want a book about military adventure, military fiction, I would read Kremlin Strike by Dale Brown. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Jim. Thank you. Well, there it is. Um, these 10 books um, that give you a general piece of this genre, which uh, include science fiction, military history, espionage, um, hardware, anything like that. Um, it may not be the most popular genre anymore, but We've enjoyed these books, and some of them are still in print or can be found. Most of the authors are still writing or have a large uh, list of books that uh, you can explore. Tom Clancy, you know, his main character, Jack Ryan, is relatively well known. There's been numerous movies done and redone of his characters. Um, I mentioned Firefox was a movie in the start of Clint Eastwood uh, back in the day. Close to 40 years old now, but uh, I still find this uh, an interesting uh, type of uh, book to read. And if you're interested in any of these topics, which include the U.S. Civil War, the Cold War, um, UK history, uh, Irish history, the IRA, um, the Soviet Union, uh, basically, you know, anything dealing with uh, world events, um, military actions, uh, things that happened, things that didn't happen, and why. Uh, there's a lot of background to these stories, and if they interest you, um, you can always find uh, information uh, here at the library or other resources, and then you may help you uh, think about uh, you know what the story was about and. Uh, be grateful that some of this Cold War situation is gone. It has been replaced by what is potentially a second Cold War, not only with the remnants of the Soviet Union, but China uh, is always uh, attempting to uh, ascend to the stage as a world superpower. And during these times of uh, social and political uh, awareness and, uh, should I say, uh, anxiety. Um, it might be interesting to read uh, about uh, how we got here or why we're here in the first place. So, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're always welcome to give us a call. Uh, we can make available a list of these titles or many of the other titles so that within the genre or others. Uh, you know, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, listening to some of this. I realize that we're not the greatest actors or narrators in the world. I'm talking about myself, not to the two 
gentlemen. But, uh, you know, we're happy to uh, offer you some uh, diversion, as you said. So, enjoy. Yeah, I would just like to say for those listening at home, too, you can put it in the chat box here. Uh, Jim, Jimmy, or I can answer any of these questions you have, recommendations. And I have a question for Jim and Jimmy. And like I said, you're welcome. Please put in the chat box what the questions are. We will get back to you or answer them tonight if we can. But if not, we'll get back to you with the uh, answers. Uh, my question for Jim is that we're obviously just barely touching the surface of this genre. Do you have one or two other books you would say, gosh, you know, if you've like some of these books, this would be one other one I think you would have. Just for somebody at home thinking like, do you have a high recommended book on this type of genre that we didn't discuss tonight? Well, as you said, I mean, we're barely uh, talking about uh, the genre, which includes so many possibilities. My personal thought is I think some of the earlier books um, by Clancy and Dale Brown, Hunt for um, Red October, I think it would be pretty solid. You know, President Reagan himself uh, was supposedly a fan, had a copy of it on, on his desk. Um, That's interesting. Who's President Reagan? Well, I'm going to have to, uh, we'll have to help you out on that in the history part, too. Um, for Dale Brown, I believe The uh, Flight of the Old Dog, his first novel, is, uh, is a really good one. Um, I actually used to go to the bookstore. There were bookstores in malls at that time. Uh, and I particularly wanted to get the first edition for copies. Uh, some of those can still be found uh, you know, used books on Amazon or eBay. Perhaps not in. I think. Um, Shara, it's very good. The Killer Angels, uh, your book, is one of the top uh, military history Civil War novels. I like ones uh, kind of alternate history that uh, we have discussed, but it's not part of this list uh, by Newt Gingrich, the Gettysburg uh, Trilogy. Oh, Gettysburg, yeah. uh, Grant Comes East, and the final book, uh, Never Call Retreat. These were about 15, 20 years ago, something like that. Um, and as always, as so many of these stories, alternate history and civil war, uh, in on who won Gettysburg, or what would have happened if uh, Lee had not attacked and that she could go up the hill and leave for the day. Um, however, the story is not one of those where you know, the, civil, the Confederates win. And uh, there's this whole new reality. Um, there's a, it actually falls into place um, in an interesting way and actually speeds up, and in my, in my case, uh, my thoughts with improves how American history goes. It forces the country, everyone, and I do mean everyone, uh, not just white soldiers, uh, African Americans. Everyone involved, this, everyone has always been involved, um, speeds up and forces them to go through, literally through hell, where we emerge as the country that perhaps we had hoped to be and should have been in today's world, very much need to be. Yeah, politics aside, Newt Gingrich is one heck of an historian. I mean, that's the, you know, I mean, I, let's throw the politics out. Just don't even, you know, one way or the other. You know, I know people are going to disagree on that, but he's one heck of an historian. Yeah, Jimmy, more, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jimmy, I got a question for you, too. I know people at home, there's a lot of Web Griffin fans out there, and you were able to cover one of the Web books. Um, what would be, if you someone came to you and says, Jimmy, what's your top three Web Griffin that you've got to have? What would you tell uh, the folks listening at home? Okay, I would say the any of the series um, Behind the Curtain, which is in the same series with this Death at Nuremberg. Then I would say some of his um, first series, the Brotherhood of War series, like the Lieutenants the colonels, 
captains, the Braves, and I would say the other one would be his Philadelphia Police series. Anyone in that series, especially the later ones, like The Last Witness, would be probably my recommendations. Thank you, Jamie. I'm going to throw it back to Jim to conclude our program. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Alice, thank you very much, Martin Sipov. Um, we hope that this uh, rough effort um, uh, is uh, of use to you, uh, or of interest. Uh, there are many other possibilities for uh, title genre discussions. Um, what Jimmy just said about the police dramas. Uh, we have a uh, possibility of, uh, I believe it's Pelicanos used to do the um, detective series in the Washington, D.C. area. And we yes. think that that's probably authors like that uh, might be somebody that you might want us to talk about because, you know, when they mention um, Tom Clancy that Jack Ryan drives down Route 50 and turns onto West Street in Annapolis or Something's happening on 14th Street or Independence Avenue in Washington, D.C. You know, most of the people around here are saying, yeah, I know that place. I live there. I've been by there. You know, those are the settings for some fun and interesting and scary stories. So um, there's many more to come, we hope. And uh, you know, we hope that you'll uh, be back and uh, have questions about this or anything, because uh, that's what we're here for. And we are doing our very best to provide answers and service in these times. Um, and remember that, uh, you know, things will be changing. Things will be getting better eventually. So as we uh, have found out in our stories we just talked about and others, you know, we do keep going. And we will get to it. So thanks very much. And we're going to end it now. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for